Welcome along to Critical Disability Studies at Manchester Metropolitan University. Very, very happy today in West Yorkshire to be able to have this opportunity to interview Fiona Kamari Campbell. Hi, Fiona. Hi, Dan. Can you remind <laughs> us of your institutional location, please? Yes, I'm at the Griffith Law School on the sunny Gold Coast, part of Griffith University in Australia. Brilliant. Thank you for that. Right, Fiona. Your book, Contours of Able, is a very important text for many of us working in disability studies. The question I suppose some of us would ask, though, is that there we are focusing upon disablism, and you come along with a text which suggests we look at ableism. Why? Well, you know, I think, you know, people with disabilities have been studied for, for several years now, in fact, several decades, and uh, little has changed. In fact, you can argue that we're one of the most studied people in the world. Um, I wanted the, 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 the spotlight to be shone back on, on the pr producers of knowledge, to be put back on, on um, able-bodied people, or more importantly, the notion of abledness. And I think that um, because it's been such a, um, a robust, enduring um, concept in terms of practices and uh, philosophy over a period of time, um, abledness seems to have had the capacity to reinvent itself, uh, whether it be abledness vis-a-vis um, you know, concepts of masculinity and femininity, ableness in terms of scientific racism, or in fact, um, ableness in terms of its capacity to constantly hive off what it sees to be as the normal, as the perfect, as the powerful, and, and then obviously the pathological, the deficient, um, the uh, riffraff, like me. Um, <laughs> um, and so I was very interested in it, obviously a very clearly, um, it's a powerful ethos. Um, that doesn't mean that disability has moved out of the picture, Dan, however, because I think uh, um, clearly, you know, as a disability studies scholar, which I situate myself as, and as a person with a disability, I'm really interested in how disability rubs up and uh, against ableness and causes discomfort. And it's through some of the study of the very bizarre circumstances that people with disabilities find themselves in, whether it be through technology or indeed performances in law, um, Ableness is able to be unveiled, so that's been really the focus. So I don't. I think it's uh, um, the objects of study can be similar, but maybe the preoccupations and the theoretical questions that are asked are somewhat different. So am I, am I right in thinking that um, studies that studies of ableism are similar, perhaps, to some of the critical whiteness studies literature that's uh, been developing over the last ten to fifteen years? Well, I I think so. I think, you know, one of the dilemmas about this sort of stuff is that we, with my, any kind of minoritisation, now I know that means different things in different places, is that we can tend to kind of create silos of knowledge or hive, hive uh, things off, and it falls into obviously identity politics. I think what I'm really interested in is that we know that, uh, you know, disability has a history, um, you know, to use those phrases, it's, it's culturally conting contingent, historically contingent, you know, there is no one disabled person who floats through history. Um, and what I'm interested in is, again, that kind of notion that it's impossible to have a concept of disability without a concept of ableness, is, is how is this fiction, I mean, it is in reality a fiction, this notion of the abled bodied person, um, you know, the abled mind, the abled intellect, the abled emotion. How is this fiction endured o over time um, when, you know, when there are variations throughout the world? So, um, so I think, uh, you know, we live in an era, for example, where ableism is able to be teased and tested out, for example, in the development of international norms um, around, you know, um, who is a disabled person, concepts of health. So it travels, um, it travels across a range of areas. We can now look, instead of just looking at disability, we can look at, well, what about the production of well-being? What about the production of beauty? Uh, what, how does it relate to other kinds of um, forms of marginality? Right, so this seems to be, in many ways, then, a, a kind of a, a bit of shift in thinking that you're proposing for disability studies in the sense that whilst important to study the conditions, for example, of disablism that lead to exclusion on the part of people with labels and impairments. What you're saying is let, let's, let's move our attention away from that. Let, let us actually look at the kind of dominant hegemonic ideas around the body, around uh, capacity, mm -hmm. around behaviour. Mm -hmm. Productivity, right. the productive citizen. 
Right. Uh, you know, uh, I think we've we've got this notion of um, you know what atomistic individualism, all these all these things that come into play. Um, even the notion, you know, and this is, I guess this is my own disciplinary background, but I think you can go beyond it about the who is a genuine disabled person. Why do we have problems about working outside of the parameters, these fixed fictional parameters of abled and disabled, where the reality is for most of us we actually have far a far greater fluid um, identity. Why are we, you know, to quote um, you know, Margaret Childrick, kind of having this uh, discomfort with this kind of notion of leakiness? And, and a lot of these issues um, come back to uh, ableism. Um, some of the emergence in the area of, of fat studies, or um, or if you want to study, um, you know, soma techniques and the techno body, or um, you know, transhumanism. All these things have uh, various kinds of links with the notion of ableness, which um, you know, which is uh, it's 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 so imprecise, and you, you actually see these systems, which are about kind of um, very. Um, cordoned off, polarised benchmarks of um, what it means to be human. Right. And, and, you know, I could do it. I always have this joke, Jan, that in another world I could get into the veterinary, philosophy of veterinary science too because I think we can learn a lot about the, um, the study of animals and even our very um, our demarcations, our anthropomorphic demarcations between, uh, you know, the scaling of bodies and the scaling of realities can be, can be hooked up in this area. And the, one of the things I've picked up on in, your, in reading your lovely writing, and it is lovely writing, is the, the word precariousness. And that's the precariousness of the, the able-bodied or a, a, you know, the precariousness of the non-disabled mm -hmm. citizen. And my, my understanding of that is that um, the ableism um, is impossible, or, or sorry, ableist ideals are impossible, not only obviously for disabled people, but for, for everybody. Would that be a fair kind of interpretation well, of the word? Well, you know, it's, it's kind of like it's a philosophical version of ambulance chasing. Like you kind of, can't <laughs> <laughs> except the ambulance is that you know, like you, you kind of you, you're not getting there. You've got you've got the you know to use um, James Overbow's um, concept of normative shadows. It's kind of it's kind of there. You're living under them, but you you know it's the kind of thing like you you're trying to get to the shadow. You're trying to get to the cloud, but you, you you're not quite there. But it's it's a marker, and it's a marker that um, is persistive. It's compulsory. It's seductive. Um, I think uh, even even you know people will often say, look, you know, of course, you know, I, I don't believe in these particular kind of ventures that are there, but you know, the whole of, of, of science, science's bu budget, the whole cure issue. I think the thing is that, um, and this is where there's some very interesting kind of notions about, um, uh, you know, uh, cure and tr and transitioning from one kind of corporeal state to an, uh, to another that we keep playing that we people can move to this kind of state of perfection. The precariousness, um, I should say, is not about um, a rather banal, and I must say I find offensive argument that we're all really disabled. Of course, we're all disabled people in some ways because that kind of, you know, um, I guess inheres the kind of deficiency model. The precariousness talks about, uh, I guess, the fact that actually if you unpack uh, the notion of the body within an ableist trajectory, that in fact um, you'll find that in fact uh, that, you know, things are not straightforward, this kind of cordoning off of, the, the, the various status into abled and disabled. Um, there's, a, there's a fracturing, there's a, there's a frailty there. Um, precariousness also is, I think, uh, a um, motive that I use in the disability experience because I think that um, people with disabilities often live very precarious lives, uh, which is far more of a powerful, realistic term than vulnerable lives mm. um, because that, for me, again, invokes passivity. But also, in many ways, um, and again, to kind of use the words of, I think it was Judith Snow, a Canadian activists that you know goodwill should be no substitute for freedom i think for most people with disabilities all it needs to be is some some support system or some policy change in government um, it can alter the balance um, precariousness and ambivalence i think uh, go together in an ableist world uh, you know but for the technology that's there to cure or but for a change in government policy uh, you know people's uh, capacity to move in a flourishing way um, is compromised Okay, so now we've kind of established the, the problems with ableism. What's the kind of alternative then? Where, where, where does this lead? When we, when we expose, if you take a kind of very Lacanian view, the, the emptiness of the kind of ableist symbolic, the mm -hmm. ableist culture, mm -hmm. we, mm -hmm. we can all recognise its complete emptiness and its, uh, and its, and its fiction. Where does this lead yeah. activism? Yeah. Where does it lead activism? Yeah, disability activism. Well, you know, I think firstly that, um, you know, we've, we, 
my work and all work is obviously situated in the cultural moment. So mm-hmm. I'm very, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm sociology trained, but I, um, you know, I read a lot of cultural studies. I've been influenced by the, the work of queer theory, but also post-colonial studies. And I think um, what I'm really interested in, see, what ableism does is it closes off possibility. It closes off imagination. And that's the way you kill people, you know, ontologically. That's, um, so I think um, by actually uh, providing a new ground, a kind of new phenomenological reality, hopefully we can then um, look then at uh, people with disabilities um, expressing another, another way of the lived body, um, uh, another imagination and, and another possibility. So I think um, that, uh, what, what will that do? I'm not sure because we also know that um, that can up the ante because certainly from my own studies where people with disabilities have attempted to present counter stories, um, those counter stories have been some, somewhat nullified or they've been re- recuperated. But I think um, I'm very much, uh, my next step in my own work, I must say, is influenced by um, uh, one, of, one, of, one of your UK folk, actually a theologian by the name of Grace M. J- Grace M. Jansen, who um, did some really interesting postmodern work around um, violence and theology. And her, her work that she was undertaking before her premature death was about this notion of natality and becoming and flourishing. So um, my sense in many ways is, is I, don't, I don't want to presume what will come out, what will come out of this. Can I say, however, I mean, um, we should not underestimate the fact that each of us are implicated in ableist thinking, and in fact, particularly internalised ableism. And I think, uh, like with the work that you're doing at the moment, I think that it's it's important for us to at least get our detective lenses and our detective manuals out and really interrogate that kind of ontology of able-bodiedness. Um, and and it's by rooting it and rooting it out and kind of um, um, unveiling that which is hidden. Um, it's, there's something I think very powerful about putting that on the table. At the same, and so so I think one of the things that the challenges are to your question are with ableism, in particular internalised ableism, is to study the way in which ableism entitles certain populations. Mm-hmm. What do they get out of it? How does it make them flourish? Because ableism has benefits. Um, on the other hand, to look at then, well, what, how does ableism and its internalisation um, um, denigrate and diminish? possibility and and then obviously looking at notions of resistance as well you know i mean it's look it's a really tough one it potentially can destabilize the whole kind of integration project and this whole kind of um i don't know whether it's strong here dan but the whole kind of project of social inclusion Mm -hmm. um because it's still very much an assimilationist model certainly in australia um and i take heart from a 1972 movie Japanese movie called ICP. I don't know whether you've seen that one. And that's about a Japanese activist group from 1972. And there's a lovely scene with one of the activist leaders who says, well, you know, we're outsiders. We've always been outsiders. And he was talking about other activists. And he said, as soon as disabled people see themselves as outsiders, um, that that point of um, separation can actually be a point of liberation. Mm. Um, you know, so I guess the, the difficulty about this is obviously I'm not suggesting that we should um, decline from activism. I think that it should shape our activism. Um, I think what we find, mind you, is most people with disabilities, you know, and I include myself in it, in it to, to a greater or lesser extent, are bought into the project of if we do this, we'll be okay. Right. You know? right. And if we jump through the hoops, um, you know, all will be well. But what we find, in fact, is that, and certainly from my own work and my work currently looking at. Um, um, you know, reasonable adjustment in the workplaces, is that whilst, yes, you can get in the door, what we find is a magnification of tensions. Right. And the right. cost the cost is, um, uh, for many people with disabilities, is still a slap in the pay- face personal cost. Yeah. So part of our work in, on ableism, I think, will help to de- developing strategies of resilience mm-hmm. with people with disabilities and also, st- obviously, strategies of resistance. Mm. I was reminded when you were talking there of Paul Hunt's fantastic uh, chapter in, in the book that he edited where he, he talks uh, about the idea that disabled people should not worry about the fact that they are seen as kind of incapable with you know within the dominant culture but actually celebrates sure. their differences yeah, and so absolutely. that seems to be kind Very of where you're going around in terms of activism yeah i think so, i think celebrating it you know i mean one of the things i'm really interested in and look and, and you can't sometimes in some bodies of knowledge you can't automatically move across but i think that um certainly the most interesting conversations i've had have been around um 
you know, some of the, the ways in which people express queer theory, for example, you know, where, you know, we're as boring as batshit as you. I don't know whether you can say that on your, on your video thing, but I just said it, you know, you know, and, um, you know, and I've seen ads, you know, there's a classic YouTube ad of these two gay men sitting on a couch and watching the rugby and it kind of said, you know, equal rights for homosexuals because we're as boring as you. Like, so do we want to go down that line with, you know, disabled people? In fact, it's even worse with disability in Australia. We say, well, they're more compliant, you know, hire a disabled person uh, in the workforce because they're not going to be like uppity unionist and all this kind of hoopla. Um, so if you turn away from that, so actually we're kind of, you know, we're, we're the whole kind of mixed kind of kit and caboodle, um, upstarts, uppity and whatever. What does that do? Um, so there's one frame there. Um, I think the other interesting thing, and that's where I think, you know, um, studies in ableism opens up other areas of knowledge that we may not have taken in. Some of my best conversations, I must say, with a colleague of mine who does a lot of work around um, transgender issues and the transgendered body. And, uh, you know, and uh, they're provocative conversations. Mm. Um, but I think, you know, and and my concern is we always have to watch resisting uh, new forms of normativity, right. even within the alternative sphere. So, I mean, you know, there's a whole queer normativity. I think, you know, we run the risk in the disability area of having kind of a disability normativity where we we, we celebrate the hero, but it's, it's still a very contrived version. Um, I think uh, I'm more interested in the, in the tension points and as I said to you, that notions of exploring that notion of precariousness. What does it mean? Mm -hmm. You know, notions mm -hmm. of shame, notions of um, uh, failure. Uh, I noticed that uh, Judith Jack Halberstam's just put out a new book on the art of failure. I think some of these kind of, uh, I, I guess, kind of maybe maybe more morose uh, areas of knowledge can shed some light in this area, uh, because I think humans have shown that they're um, they're, they're they're not just resilient. We're, we're very creative in in refashioning ourselves. Fiona Kamari Campbell, thank you very much. Thanks, Dan.